Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Dr. Dad's podcast. David Wardy, how are you? I'm fantastic, brother. How are you? Doing great. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. We've got a, a doctor on that that I've been so you know brilliantly inspired by since we've had a, a chance to first connect. And so we've got Dr. Michael Stewart on uh, to the podcast today. Thanks so much for being here, Dr. Michael. Yeah, I appreciate it. And thank you for all of your help that you're giving me in my endeavors as well. Absolutely. So I, I want to do a little introduction of you and then we're going to get into some of your story and then uh, and then talk about this amazing, incredible field of medicine and research in CBD and beyond. So Dr. Michael Stewart was a, or is a licensed physician of more than 28 years. He's worked both in family practice, HIV medicine, hospice and palliative care. He was on the leading edge of caring for patients with HIV back in the mid 90s when protease inhibitors weren't yet available and treatment of the disease was still in its nascent stages. Dr. Stewart's office in Denver treated over 1,200 patients with IV, HIV, sorry, being the largest family practice off, office providing HIV care in five state region. Now, uh, above and beyond what he's done in that research, he's really been uh, on the forefront in innovation of, um, of a company called Endorage which has been uh, part, uh, basically part of an education platform, uh, uh, supplementation platform, and also offering research into the field of using CBD products for uh, all sorts of cool things that we're going to be talking about. So Dr. Michael Stewart, I think one of our, our first question for you is, is, you know, you were immersed so deeply in family practice and, and all the work that you were doing in HIV. Tell us a little bit about the, the crossover experience into, into what you're doing now, um, just to give people a little bit more of your, I guess, your philosophy and insight into, um, into you know, what, what led you down this new path. Sure, absolutely. If, if you don't mind, I do have to have a little disclaimer up front because I am still a licensed physician and I, I am involved in the production of cannabinoid medicines, which means that I'm prohibited from recommending, advising, or prescribing cannabis products. And I actually fully agree with that because um, when it comes to cannabis and what I believe that it does, I'm a hammer and everything looks like a nail to me. Um, so this is an educational session and, uh, and really not uh, medical advice um, for uh, people. But anything you learn here, please take to your primary care doc or to uh, another provider and run it past them. And if they have questions or concerns, I can talk freely with other providers, but I'm prohibited from doing that with clients or patients, just, uh, um, you know, so that we get the attorneys all happy. Um, yeah, I was board certified in family practice. Um, and uh, after I, well, even during residency, uh, I started doing uh, some work in the HIV field. And uh, I did that, as you mentioned, before the protease inhibitors were readily available. They were in expanded access at that point in time. And so when I began studying HIV care, the playing field changed dramatically and fast. And so within a year's period of time, because that was where my attention really was, anybody who hadn't been keeping up over that year was left behind. Experienced in HIV care in the new therapies that were available. Um, but one of the things that I, I clearly learned, sorry, I'm getting a message, my internet's becoming unstable, first time today, but um, <clears throat> what I really learned is that um, it wasn't any one thing that was going to treat HIV, but it was really having to look at the person as a whole person and to um, make sure that folks were feeling connected to a system that was serving them. Um, the office that I had, I was uh, very fortunate. I had a psychotherapist working with me. I had a massage therapist, somebody doing Chinese medicine and acupuncture. Um, for a while, uh, I had a naturopathic physician with me as well. And uh, the other thing that uh, was really quite a gift is that the office that had originally been founded, one of the co-founders was a dentist. And uh, this was before we really understood that chronic inflammation in the mouth was going to have impact elsewhere in the body. And so just by default, we were very aggressive with dental care in our clients. And, um, you know, we were uh, just doing some things that, that weren't quite normal back in the 1990s, as far as our focus uh, and into 2000, of course. 
um, <clears throat> which I think people understand now. And uh, the real um, uh, issue is that I, I became very comfortable managing chronic inflammatory diseases. So um, I did notice that um, even though I was not writing uh, letters of recommendation for medicinal marijuana back then, I had several of my clients who were asking for them. Um, there was a group of infectious disease that uh, uh, doctors that I worked very closely with, they were comfortable writing those recommendations. And so I would refer my clients to them for a consultation and a recommendation. And then uh, back then, because the tests were not so sophisticated to be able to decipher where a positive test result was coming from, um, we would give them a prescription for a medication that would interfere with their drug testing. Um, so most of what I did to support medical marijuana use in my practice was um, interacting with the uh, medical review officers that were responsible for drug testing in the workplace and getting them to report positive tests as negative because of the um, <clears throat> medications that they were on uh, that uh, justified a positive drug test. Um, what I did notice with my clients that were using medical marijuana is they were overall doing really well. And fortunately, I had a, a group of people that were very inspired and they were willing to do what it took. But I really noticed that my folks with uh, medical marijuana cards um, were probably just doing better than my other folks were. And so it caught my attention. Um, but I didn't know that much about uh, cannabis medicine back then. I was pretty busy staying current with HIV. Um, you know, I was working 60 hours a week. I didn't take time uh, away to study cannabinoid medicine um, and uh, really had my focus on uh, what uh, the pharmaceutical industry was offering and how to manage the side effects of that and some of the other things that were, were going on. Um, uh, but really, it always stayed with me that uh, folks were truly using this as medicine and not just as, a, as an excuse to get high. About seven years ago, I had an opportunity to be an investor, an investor in a medical marijuana company in California. And that's when I really chose to study uh, medicinal cannabis in a much more diligent way. And I discovered the endocannabinoid system, which I had not been taught in medical school and uh, really was uh, inspired to study cannabinoid medicine. Um, and uh, that's really how I got to where I am today. Um, I'm now co-founder of Enderaj, um, which is a full cannabis flower medicine company. We make non-euphoric non cannabis medicines, although we're not allowed to call them medicines because we have not done an investigational new drug application. They're incredibly expensive. Um, usually about eight figures to get one of those done. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are a startup company, um, but we are an approved uh, food supplement and nutraceutical in the state of Colorado. And because the 2018 Farm Bill in the United States was signed, uh, we are legal in all 50 states in the United States. Um, let's see, maybe direct me on on yeah. where to go from there. But um, I've just, in, in many ways, even though cannabis is a medicine that's been used for over 6,000 years, um, we really eliminated it from our experience about 100 years ago. And uh, so it is much like bringing novel clinical therapies uh, or uh, into clinical practice today. And uh, that is something I have experience with and uh, love to see people do well. That's amazing. I, I love the the trajectory of, of how you practice and, and how you've evolved as a doctor over time. And I always think it's interesting just how, you know, we, we keep coming to the thing that we're, we're meant to be coming to. And, and it's like all these little, you know, interesting series of events that, uh, that have allowed you to, to be where you are now. I'm, I'm curious. I mean, I do want, I, what I, what I, where I want this to go next is to help people understand the endocannabinoid system, you know, what that means for us as human beings and our relationship to the plant, but just maybe briefly, how would you do medicine differently, you know, working with that HIV, HIV population and using CBD? And maybe that's uh, something that comes as you, as you go through the discussion on, on, the endocannabinoid system, but um, I would love to hear that aspect as well. But maybe maybe we'll jump into uh, what is what is the system? Why are we so intimately connected to it? And then I'd love to hear some of that well, afterthought. 
Yeah, the, the brief answer to your question is I would have been focusing much more on the endocannabinoid system and keeping it in balance um, in the process of managing diseases, whether they're acute or chronic. Mm. Um, and um, uh, let's see, bring me bring me back to... Uh, yeah, so let's. what is the endocannabinoid system? It's a mouthful right. to say, like, what, what does this mean for people and, and why is this important to them with regards well, to their health? We'll break it down just a little bit. Endo means it's our own naturally occurring and cannabinoid uh, related to the cannabis plant and system is, is that system. So it's a system of ligands or these molecules that our body produces and receptors um, that then receive those, uh, those singles or ligands. And uh, then it also is the enzymes that break down um, the cannabinoids that we produce naturally. That's our naturally occurring endocannabinoid system. It's uh, intimately involved in homeostasis or our natural state of well being. And our bodies are designed to be able to withstand stresses. Um, and when that happens, uh, we have a variety of responses that happen in our body to adapt to those stresses. And it's designed to do that not on a chronic base, but on an acute base basis. Um, so the endocannabinoid system is really designed to bring us back into balance after stresses. And that, that's a very simplistic view, but I think it's, it's a good foundation at least. So if you see a deer and it's uh, grazing there in a nice meadow and uh, a cougar comes by and is stalking the deer and the deer runs away, the fight or flight system is going to be involved because there's a, an immediate stress. The deer needs to run away or fight or get eaten or, you know, um, and so the deer, let's say, gets away from the cougar, and in about 15 or 20 minutes, all of its system goes back to normal, and it's grazing again, and it's having a good time, and the endocannabinoid system is the system that allows us to return to that natural state of being. So when we're in, you know, pain, for example, pain is a very important thing for us to experience because it indicates there's something wrong. We need to pay attention to what's going on. If I put my hand on a hot stove, it's nice that I retract my hand right away and I recognize that there's pain there. And once I've had a burn and I withdraw my hand and that pain stimulus is still there, cannabis or the endocannabinoid system is going to come in to help attenuate that pain because the signal was meant to notify me of something, um, but it's not designed to be there in perpetuity. And this you know, endocannabinoid system is going to bring us back to that uh, more natural state of being that we have. And there are a variety of ways we support our naturally occurring endocannabinoid system. And that's through our GI health and proper food and nutrition, voluntary exercise, um, meditation, yoga. Um, anytime you're really getting into a, a state where you're in a very uh, comfortable zone, you're listening to beautiful music and you're relaxed, that, those are all things that support our endocannabinoid system. In addition to that, phytocannabinoids can also come in. So if our systems are knocked out of balance and maybe our diets aren't as good as they should be, and so our microbiome is a little bit challenged and we're under some pretty chronic stressors, um, we can get some help from the phytocannabinoids to help bring us back into balance. You know, not designed to be used every day on a, on a regular basis um, if you don't need to. Um, because hopefully we will go back to those practices that are within our ourselves as opposed to reaching outside of ourselves to do that. What, one quick question on the endocannabinoids. So this is something endogenously our body can make on its own. You said they're, they're technically, you know, I guess maybe peptides or ligands, you said, or mm -hmm. is, is there, does there come a point where people either, again, maybe because of gut health or just overexpression of them um, that they just become depleted and we need phytocannabinoids or is there a way that our body can rebuild them on their own? Well, our body does rebuild them. Um, now, so what, what we're probably getting into here is an endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. And that could be genetic. There is some indications that some people have a predisposition toward that, but it's more epigenetic. So it's more environment than it is hardwired into our genes. But we certainly can have a propensity to not make enough endocannabinoids or to 
um, make too many of the enzymes that, that chew them up and um, degrade them, um, or for some reason our endocannabinoid receptors are not functioning the way they should be functioning. For example, if you have some toxic mold or something and that cellular structure is a little bit um, um, inflamed, that those receptors uh, may not function as we would uh, expect them to normally. Um, but we produce, you know, I'm going to talk about two of the receptors and, and two of the endocannabinoids that we uh, have in our bodies. And one of the uh, naturally occurring cannabis-like substances we have is called anandamide. It's two, um, the other is 2-AG or 2-arachidonyl glycerol. And they have different functions in our bodies and they uh, interact with cannabinoid receptors in our body, which we have more of than any of type of receptor, even though I wasn't taught about it in medical school. Um, we do know about it now. The CB1 receptors, which are primarily in brain and nerve tissue, and the CB2 receptors, which are more in the immune system, but they are all throughout our bodies. Um, our naturally occurring cannabinoids are made by our bodies right in the location where they're needed. Then through a process called retrograde transmission, they affect the cell that is signaling the cell that made the endocannabinoid. Um, and then they're degraded in our bodies generally uh, in the same place where they're used. So there aren't large amounts of endocannabinoids floating around in our bodies for us to measure. They're locally produced and locally degraded. And the phytocannabinoids are a little different because they're either applied you know, to the skin and in which it would be a local application um, or they're ingested or they're inhaled um, or they're absorbed through the um, you know, sublingual mucosa. Um, and that way they get into our bodies. And so the, the phytocannabinoids are more of a systemic response um, rather than a local response. Um, one of the very interesting things about our endocannabinoids systems, if we're cannabis naive, so we haven't been exposed to the phytocannabinoids for a while, over about the first 72 hours when we come across these plant cannabinoids, we upregulate our naturally occurring endocannabinoid receptors. So we become more sensitive to our naturally occurring system right where the body thinks it needs it and right in the proportions the body thinks it needs it. So in many ways, it's kind of interesting that cannabis can sort of act like a nutrient in certain circumstances and more like a medicine in other um, uh, situations. For example, if you are deficient in vitamin C, you develop a disease called scurvy. Um, a very small amount of vitamin C, uh, 100, 200 milligrams or eating an orange will take away the scurvy. But if you wanna use vitamin C as an anti-inflammatory, you're gonna to have to go up on that dose from 200 milligrams probably to 20 grams. And if I gave a client 20 grams of vitamin C and it wasn't in some sophisticated uh, liposomal delivery system and I gave it to them orally, they're probably not going to be my friend after that. You know, they're going to have abdominal cramping, explosive diarrhea. They're just not going to have a good time with it. We could give it to them IV. And I used to do that in certain circumstances, but it's about a four hour IV infusion. And it's not inexpensive and it's inconvenient. And so we don't do it that way. Cannabis is much the same way. If your endocannabinoid system is out of balance and all you really need to do is to rebalance it by upregulating your naturally occurring endocannabinoid receptors, then very small amounts of cannabis are gonna work. And I'm talking about maybe two and a half milligrams to five milligrams and some people just once a day. So if somebody has an endocannabinoid uh, deficiency and there's a triad that very oftentimes is associated with that, which would be fibromyalgia, irritable bowel and migraine headaches, just a very small amount of uh, cannabis can have some pretty dramatic effects in that. Now, if you're using cannabis as an anti-seizure, anti-anxiety medication, um, maybe you're using it as an anti-inflammatory, um, or if you're undergoing uh, uh, cancer treatment and you're using it to help or instead of uh, some other therapies, you're probably going to have to go up on the dose very significantly in the same way, not, not quite to the degree you would with vitamin C, but you probably have to move from those, you know, two and a half milligrams to 
you know, 10 to 20 or uh, even 30. And, and you can go much higher in the dose. Cannabis is a very safe medication, especially when we're talking about lower THC concentrations. Even the higher THCs are, are safe. They're just unpleasant to use in high doses. Um, so it, it, I wouldn't necessarily call cannabis a nutrient, but it certainly has that ability to act a little bit more like that in certain circumstances than uh, just a medicine. That's awesome. David, go ahead. I know you got some questions there. Well, no, I just find it fascinating. I mean, this stuff kind of like, like he said earlier, this disappeared, right? We weren't using this. And then, you know, he clinically starts finding that there's this massive effect for his patients for probably a massive spectrum of things when we talk about inflammation and pain management, all these things. And then you're, I mean, you're sharing with us, and this is something I tell all my patients, we actually have a system built in our bodies for this stuff. Yet it's almost like this is the new, new in the past, what, like five years, five, <laughs> last five to 10 years. It's like, Oh, it's new medicine. We're going to use this stuff. But I mean, how long did you tell me that this has been used in medicine? Like 6,000 well, years or something? Like we know that it was used during the Egyptian times. And, and there's certain, um, there's some evidence that it goes back even further than that. But, but cannabis has been used, you know, for thousands of years. I don't think anybody disputes that and used as a whole plant and used safely. And, you know, I finally get to the place where when people want to, <laughs> to debate the safety of cannabis, I'm, I'm at a place where I'll say, I tell you what, I've got a trial that I think you should be involved with. It's a double-blinded placebo-controlled trial to evaluate the efficacy of the parachute. And it happens to have a crossover arm in it too. And uh, we, you know, we have plenty of evidence to show that this is a very, very safe um, uh, plant to use. Um, it was not removed from our using it as a medicine because it was ineffective um, or that it was dangerous. It was removed for political and economic reasons. That's great. So obviously there's a long history there. There's uh, it's, it's, it's a part of us. We couldn't survive or re-regulate ourselves without our, our endocannabinoid system. Um, I love that you brought in the actual name, anandamide. Uh, I mean, it's talked to, anandamide's talked a ton about in you know flow state, and Stephen Collar brings this up in a lot of his books, which I, which I think is brilliant because you know in our distracted and our dysregulated lives, living in chronic state of you know fear, frustration, or uh, dependency, and all that, we we really uh, you know we've been distracted from finding these you know different states of consciousness within. But what I do want to dive into now is uh is talking about you know cbd is not all the same you know there's lots of different products out there people are probably wondering well you know i've got the cbd product it, it worked or didn't work for me um is there reasons for why you know some products may be more efficient than others with regards to you know the, t the part of the plants you use or male versus female and then i'd also like you to talk a little bit about the ratios because i think a lot of people get um, concerned about CBD w in relation to the ratio of THC and the hallucinogenic based effects. So if we could talk about some of the physiology there. Yeah. And you know, at, at risk of sort of sounding like an infomercial for the, the company I co-founded, let me tell you how we make our products. And then I will tell you why. And I think that will answer those questions. So what we use in, in our products is mature, virgin, organically grown female flower. We don't use the whole plant, we just use the flower because that's where the medicine is in the plant. Um, you know, if you want a glass of orange juice, you generally go to an orange tree and you peel the orange and you juice it. And that's sort of the way we make our products. Um, you could go to an orange tree, cut it down, throw it in a wood chipper, and then extract your orange juice out of it that way. That's what most products on the market today do. Um, so we are using the organically grown because uh, cannabis is used in phytoremediation. So cleaning up the soil, they use it at Rocky Flats, they use it in Chernobyl. It's a great concentrator of the impurities in the soil, which is a beautiful mm -hmm. thing about the plant. It can house us, feed us, heal us, clean us, you know, clean the soil, do all those things. But you don't want to use the same plant that cleans your soil as your medicine or to eat it. Um, the medicine is only in the flower, and because we're only picking the flower, our extraction processes are a little simpler. 
Um, they're more expensive because the flower's more expensive, but we, uh, we use ambient heat except in the decarboxylation process or activating the cannabinoids. So we try to keep this plant the closest we can to the way mother nature made her and still put it in a bottle. Um, the mature virgin flower, what uh, she's doing is she is producing this sticky resin, which is the medicine of the plant to try to get herself pollinated. So if you have male plants in the same vicinity as the female plant, she's going to want to be pollinated and then turn her attention toward making seeds rather than medicine. And so that's why it needs to be a female flower. Um, most of the CBD products that we have in the United States right now are actually mislabeled. There are several studies that show that. Many of them contain heavy metals and residual pesticides as well as solvents. Um, so it's incredibly important that any CBD product you use has some testing done on it. First, you want to know what's in the product. A CBD isolate is not a bad medicine, but it is not a full flower medicine. It doesn't contain the other cannabinoids as well as the medicinal terpenes in it, and it's not going to be as effective as a full plant medicine is. Um, so the full plant medicine is what we're doing. We are a CBD rich full hemp flower company. Um, and the reason hemp is cannabis, so is marijuana. Um, hemp is just simply cannabis with less than 0.3% THC in it. And um, so the, the flower is the important part. Um, you want to make sure that when you're looking for a product, um, if you do not want to be euphoric or intoxicated, you're looking at your CBD to THC ratios. Um, our products generally are all about 20 to 1, 20 parts CBD to 1 part THC. And generally, when you are above 4 parts CBD to THC, the euphoria or intoxication intoxication isn't going to happen. There'll be a few outliers that at a four to one ratio may have some intoxication or euphoria. Um, but certainly when you get to 10 to one and 20 to one, you're not going to feel, um, you know, that you're not going to get quote unquote high from the plant, although you'll have an elevated mood. Um, the terpenes um, and other cannabinoids are extremely important in the medicinal qualities um, of what you're getting out of your CBD product. And if you don't have them, you're not gonna take advantage of it. So most of the time, I will say that a, a true um, full flower medicine is going to be about five times as potent as a CBD isolate is. And when you get into the full flower medicines that are terpene rich, which we are, they're about 10 times as potent. And so while these medicines are quite a bit more expensive to buy, in the long run, they're not more expensive to use. Um, but when you're looking for a, a product, you wanna know, number one, it comes from flower, comes from female flower. You wanna be able to know what's in the bottle. So you wanna know the CBD, the THC ratios, the other cannabinoids that are in there. You want to know the terpenes that are in there. And those are the, the parts of the plant that give it the, uh, the aroma, the smell of the plant. And different terpenes have different medicinal qualities as well. We wanna keep this plant as close to the way mother nature made her as we can, because we know when we take isolates of all the different components of the plant, and we try to Frankenstein them back together and teach it how to walk and talk, it's not that it's a bad medicine, but it acts a whole lot more like an isolate than it does like full flower medicine. And then we also have to make sure that this product is safe. So checking for heavy metals um, is important, especially because this plant can be used in phytoremediation. So we wanna make sure there's, there's not toxic lead in there, mercury, arsenic, um, and then in addition to that, um, there is an extraction process that this goes through and many folks are using solvents and many of those solvents can be toxic. It's not a problem if your extraction process is complete because those solvents are removed and you can get some, some very good products out of bupane and propane extracted uh, um, cannabis products. We don't happen to use those. We use a non-toxic solvent um, that's proprietary, so I'm not allowed to talk about it. Um, but it doesn't mean that other people's, because they're using a solvent which could be harmful, is a problem. You just need to test to make sure it's not there. And then, of course, you need to make sure that there are no residual pesticides. 
Um, you know, the cultivators that we use when there's a bug problem, they like to let the chickens out. Um, and then they, you know, take the chickens back after the bugs are gone because chickens like to eat bugs and they'd rather eat bugs than the cannabis plants. Um, so it's, it's important that your product come from a clean source, but then it's also very important that you have the test. So you've got the cannabinoid and terpene profile, you have the heavy metals tests, you have the pesticides, residual solvents, and then you also need to make sure that there aren't any microbes in there. Because if the plant's been harvested and it's allowed to stay a little bit wet, you can get molds and yeasts and other things like that growing in there. And they're just not things you want in your medicine. Um, so having the third party test done is very, very important. Um, and I can tell you, we actually had a product that came back positive for isopropyl alcohol, which is a solvent that some people use, um, but we didn't use it in the extraction process. And so we were a little bit baffled about how could isopropyl alcohol be in our product? And um, we did a little further investigation. And as it turned out, somebody who was very well-meaning had cleaned one of the machines, but not done it appropriately. Mm -hmm. And so there was a residual solvent in there and we had a batch we had to throw away. And what that shows is that even well-intentioned people make mistakes. I guarantee you this lady that you know, wound up being responsible was devastated. And the good news is, you know, we didn't trust our process. We sent it to a third party lab and we had it tested. And so those tests are incredibly important and they're important that you see them before you buy the product. Um, so if you don't have those tests, if it's not from flour, um, then it's not a product that I would recommend. Doesn't mean there aren't some outliers and, and reasons to use it. You know, if you have, if you're covered by insurance and your child has a seizure disorder and you use Epidiolex, which is an FDA approved CBD isolate to treat certain pediatric seizure disorders, go ahead and use it. There's an appropriate place for it. But even the manufacturers of that will tell you, at least candidly, that um, there's a better way to do it. You know, they're doing it in the way that they can so that it's patentable and it can be an FDA approved medication. And uh, we're out there and we're doing this. We know other people will copy what we're doing. And uh, we intend to stay the leaders by continuing to refine our methods and come out with targeted formulas for specific indications. And I'm really excited about how that aspect of things is going. That's amazing. I mean, you gave so much important information for people to ponder. I, I mean, here, here in BC, British Columbia, um, marijuana was, you know, within the last couple of years was legalized, meaning people could be purchasing it from the, some of the different dispensaries and whatnot. But this, I mean, when we talk about the general public, most of them are just like, you know, I'm just going to get my prescription or gonna, I'm going to get my product. And they're relying obviously on the people in, the, in these dispensaries to you know, recommend the right one based on the symptoms that are there. But it's these kind of conversations that you're having with us right now that are, in my mind, the most important. Because otherwise, mm -hmm. we're, we're just kind of, you know, looking at a label and going, well, this is the concentration of the ratio. Therefore, this is the right one for you. And obviously, it's there's more to the story than just that right there. Well, and that's that's why we market to clinicians. You know, you're not going to find our product in the gas store, or gas station, or or you know, on Amazon. And that's because we have a clinician grade product and we pride ourselves in being supportive to our clinicians. So mm -hmm. if any of our clinicians have any, you know, questions, they can always get a, a session with me and we can discuss a particular client or we can do things like we're doing with you here. Um, but we, we believe that medicine is best used by people who know how to use it. And if we're treating ourselves with things that are over the counter, it doesn't mean the products we're using are inappropriate, but do we have the appropriate guidance on how to use it? And especially when every single, you know, chemovar or strain of this plant has different medicinal qualities, it gets to be a pretty complex industry out there. And, you know, the docs at the Society of Cannabis Clinicians, and, you know, there's some fantastic research that's being done, you know, over in Technion in Israel that, that I'm really um, excited about. But then again, I'm, I'm also really excited about the research that we're doing, because we're bringing it from the Petri dish into people. You know, we have a phase four clinical 
trial. The, the therapies they have out for COVID right now, they're, they're in phase three. They've not been approved. They've been emergency authorized. But what we have is an approved nutraceutical that we are testing now to see if we can attenuate the symptoms of post-acute COVID syndrome. And, you know, I'm really excited. Can you walk us through that? Because I mean, that, that ties into everything you're speaking to at the beginning with the imbalanced or the overwhelmed endocannabinoid system. So yeah, let's, well, let's dive into that a little bit. Sure. Well, post-acute COVID syndrome, um, it was being called over this last summer, people were calling themselves long haulers. These are folks who were infected with COVID-19 and they just didn't get better. The primary symptoms that they were talking about, by the way, I did training to be a, a COVID doc. I was asked to be a part of a COVID center in Southern California, and I was in Denver at the time. I actually moved back to Southern California, did my training. They did the background checks. Um, they never got busy enough to actually need me, so I went back to my home in Northern Michigan and uh, was an alternative for them via Zoom, but that's how I started doing my studying into COVID-19. And this last summer, we did a 10-week podcast with long haulers. And uh, primarily they were, you know, uh, having postural, postural orthostatic tachycardia, they were short of breath, they had brain fog. Some of them were getting, you know, blue toes and fatigue and just a whole variety of things going on. And, and their doctors at that point in time weren't taking them seriously. It's a very different arena now. They're not being sent home saying, you're all just crazy. You're just stressed out, go to bed and you know, get up and go to work tomorrow. Um, but after listening to these folks, and I did private sessions with people as well, um, they were all educational sessions. And um, I really came to the conclusion that it appeared like this was some type of post-viral autoimmune reaction going on and that inflammation was really the driving factor of what was going on. And um, after listening to them and knowing that there's inflammation going on, there's anxiety going on, there's depression going on, there's the fatigue going on, there's the brain fog going on, um, I actually put together a, um, uh, a targeted formula for this. It's called our Formula C and uh, used a blend of different chemovars. So full plants blended together, not isolates put together, but full plants plants blended together so that I could take advantage of um, several different uh, cannabis chemovars and the medicinal qualities they had to offer. And the antidotal evidence that we got back from that product a few months later, um, one of our sales team uh, called people who had purchased our product and did a survey. And uh, the results were pretty phenomenal. People were, were really, even those who had used cannabis before, um, we're finding that their symptoms improved dramatically with Formula C. So, so much so that we are just now enrolling a phase four clinical trial so that we can get some, some better evidence-based medicine rather than, you know, antidotal reports. So this works really well. You know, now we'll have a clinical trial where we can really evaluate that. And um, I'm just, I'm, I'm really excited about it because what it appears to me is that through the, the stress that we're experiencing, we're getting our endocannabinoid systems knocked out of balance. And even though these folks are paying attention now to a variety of different natural ways to put their systems back into balance, the voluntary exercise, the you know, mindfulness and meditations and paying attention to their microbiome, um, they're not getting better fast. And so we're giving them a little help with the phytocannabinoids and it really seems to be working. And, um, you know, ask me in a little bit, um, you know, a couple of months and we'll be able to give you uh, some of those results. But you know how medical trials go. To be able to go from concept to a phase four clinical trial in June, and here we are now in April, and we're enrolling that trial is almost unheard of speed. That's amazing. And and the, from last we spoke, there's there's still an opportunity for people to be a part of the trial. Is there, or is there uh, what's we, going we on are, there? We are now, if people are interested, they would go to clinicaltrials.gov. And if they type in the word Enderage, we have two clinical trials there. One is not enrolling yet, and that's about using cannabis to attenuate alcohol use. But this one will come up. 
um, to attenuate the post-acute COVID syndrome. And even though right now it says not enrolling, we are just beginning to enroll our first clients and the contact information um, is available there. So if people are interested, I would, I would bring them directly to clinicaltrials.gov. Excuse me? Oh, it's updated. We are enrolling officially. There See how go. quickly things change? <laughs> that was fast. David, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> Doc, I'd love to talk about delivery systems. You know, there's so much things out there right now with CBD. And, you know, some of the things I'll hear from people are, oh, I'll notice this one works better than this one. When there mm -hmm. used to be, you have the liposomal, you have the tinctures, you have the pastes. I mean, there's all these different delivery systems. Can you talk a little bit to maybe certain ailments that people may be struggling with where certain delivery systems may be better versus others and how all that works? Sure. And, and you know, this, remember, we're talking about a, a pretty unregulated industry right now, and we're getting into all the fancy delivery systems. But let's go back and talk about what are we delivering? You know, if, if we have a beautiful delivery system to deliver something that doesn't work, it's still not going to work. And so let's go back. Is it from flour? <laughs> and if it's from flour, what is the CBD to THC ratio so that you can know whether or not this product is, is going to make you euphoric or intoxicated? Doesn't mean it's bad, but you do want to know that before you get in a car. And let's look at the CBD to terpene ratio. Does this really have the full flower in it? And is it terpene rich? And if those things have been met and it's a safe medicine, you have the other tests done to assure us that it doesn't have the heavy metals, the microbes or the residual solvents or pesticides, then it's a good product. And then let's, let's talk about, you know, what does a good product mean? A delivery mechanism that's liposomal delivery to, mean, to me means it's probably going to be absorbed in the GI tract. It's meant to be taken orally. Do you need the liposomal delivery? And the answer is, if you are taking a CBD product on an empty stomach and you have a liposomal delivery system and you are swallowing it, you're not absorbing it through the... Um, uh, sublingual mucosa there, then a liposomal delivery system can increase the amount of CBD that's absorbed. But you can also increase that by taking some fat with your, your CBD product. So there are certain indications where some of those delivery systems would be beneficial. But the delivery systems that I would talk about more that I think have a lot more clinical application than the bells and whistles and is it nano or do I have a different proprietary blend or is it liposomal or you know what is it is are you inhaling the product and if you're inhaling it is that the right way for you to inhale it you're going to have a very rapid onset of action and it's not going to last as long very appropriate for acute settings you know you need something you get an anxiety attack and you want to have an anti-anxiolytic effect and you want it now, then a vaporized uh, cannabis is, is probably a good way to go. I'm not a fan of incinerating, incinerating our medications and most of the vape pens out there, I'm not a fan of the plastics they're using in it, um, but there are good ways to vaporize your medicine. And if you are confident in the product that you're using, and the vape cartridge that you're using, then vaping is also um, another route. Um, the next would be if you're taking something orally and you want the full effect of the terpenes and you want to have an effect relatively quickly, um, you would put it underneath your tongue and allow it to be absorbed there. Both the inhalation and under the tongue bypass the first metabolism through the liver. And so you get to have more medicine before your liver either changes it into something that's an active metabolite or one that's an inactive metabolite, but they do work a little differently. And so sublingual administration is probably my favorite route now. Um, and then, of course, there's taking things that would be in a gel cap form or a capsule or even eating whole plant. And there can be you know, benefits to that as well. Um, you're going to get rid of most of the terpenes in the GI tract. So they're going to be destroyed in the stomach. You're not going to have as much of an effect of the, that entourage effect of the plant with the, the terpenes. Your, um, 
the length of time you're going to have that medicine in your system is going to be longer than the sublingual or the um, inhaled route. Um, and, and they can be very good delivery mechanisms as well. Um, there are some rectal suppositories out there. THC doesn't appear to be absorbed very well that direction. That direction. Um, vaginal suppositories are getting a little bit more notice and they do work pretty well is my understanding. I don't have the clinical experience with them yet, but I'm starting to hear more about them from the clinicians that do. Um, we do make a deep penetrating cream um, and that is where your delivery system, so the base that you're putting the product in can be very beneficial because cannabis does not get through your skin very well unless it's matched with a carrier. You know, you hear a lot about taking zinc right now because of COVID-19. Well, take zinc, that's great, but if you don't match it with an ionophore such as quercetin, it's not going to get into the cell where it does its work. And so similarly, you could put rub cannabis over your knee for your osteoarthritic pain, but if it's not in a carrier that's gonna allow it to penetrate deeply, um, it's probably not going to get to where the pain is. It'll still be good for skin conditions, but that deep penetrating you might need. Um, the particular product that we use is in a, a base called Lipoderm, which has been clinically evaluated. The compounding pharmacists use it when they want to deliver something um, deeper than just skin level. Um, so topicals can be incredibly uh, helpful. You know, if you wind up getting a bee sting or you wind up getting into poison ivy or poison oak, it almost doesn't matter what cannabis product you put on your skin there, it's going to help. You know, <laughs> you put leaves on there, who knows, it might, you know, flower at least, it, it may help. But oils or deep penetrating creams, um, because you're dealing with a surface issue, you really don't have to have that deep penetration. Um, let's see other delivery mechanisms that I'm missing that are out there. Um, uh, on, on the I topic of, it, on, on the topic of inhaled, is there, I mean, I'm thinking in clinic, in cl clinics where, where you're allowed to deliver, um, can you do it as a nebulized form? Okay. Nebula. Yeah. hydrogen thank you that's something i will look into oh you cut out you cut out for a bit there i i missed you after i asked um if you could use it as a nebulized um product well it probably cut me off because i didn't know the answer <laughs> Um, and, and I don't, I don't know whether you can nebulize cannabis, okay. um, but that is something that I would want to look into. You certainly want to have a water soluble one if you're going to, um, and that presents its own issues because cannabis tends to be, um, you know, fat soluble and not so water soluble, although we do have some ways of making that happen. I would really have to go into that and make sure that the way that we can make cannabis water soluble is not going to be something that has something in there that would be harmful to the lungs. Right. Right. I was just thinking of, you know, some of those long haulers, as you mentioned before, where they've got that, you know, chronic, you know, lung pathology that seems to, to linger and, and how do we support that lung tissue a little bit more? Well, because it's getting right into that lung area as well. Yeah, you, you cut out again a little bit there. Oh, so. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. <laughs> I did a speed test and everything before I got on here. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Um, what, what I, and the next kind of topic I want to talk about in relation to this is, is uh, with regards to the ratio. So, you know, if there's, if there's a sleep formula, you've got the wellness formula. Like, are, are we sort of playing with the ratios of THC to C, CBD when it comes to different, you know, issues that people are dealing with or what's happening there? Sort of. Um, you're barking up the right tree. We're playing different ratios of the cannabinoids and the terpenes. So, for example, with our formula ZZZ, we're sort of getting around the fact that THC is a better medicine to help you sleep mostly. I mean, some people are different, but overall, if somebody is having difficulty sleeping, I would reach for a little higher THC concentration product. 
I can't do that and stay industrial hemp and legal in the United States. And so what we use in there is a cannabinoid called CBN. And CBN is what THC turns into when it's been left around for a while. It doesn't make you as euphoric as THC does. And then when we combine it with the CBD, we take that away as well. But it still has the sedating effect of the THC. And so I combine a different cannabinoid ratio. We still have CBD in there. We have CBN in there. That's one of the few times we add into our full plant medicine an isolate of a cannabinoid um, because that's the way that we can get it right now. We, otherwise, we've got to leave stuff around for a year or two before it turns into CBN. And then we have to be careful on the terpenes that we have in there because many of the terpenes can be very activating. And so we had to play around with that formulation for a little while before we, we finally found it. I think we had six or seven different preparations. We had different people trying out until we kind of narrowed it in on a little lighter terpene concentration than we normally put in. So our cannabinoids in that one are going to have CBD and CBN primarily. And then we're going to be a little bit lighter on our terpene ratios and higher in um, in one of them called myrcene, um, which can be relatively sedating, and another one called linalool, which can be more relaxing. Um, and then I had to really watch the amount of some of the other terpenes like pinene that can be pretty activating. And this one, it, I'm, I'm really happy with the way ZZZ is, is getting reported back to me. And I, I've used it a couple of times myself. Um, and for situational insomnia, and it worked well for me too. It is one of the two formulations we have out there that's designed to be used on an as-needed basis rather than on a regular basis. And by a regular basis, by that I mean that when you start using a cannabis product, it takes 72 hours for your body to fully upregulate your naturally occurring cannabinoid receptors. So if you're gonna use something for anxiety because you have anxiety you know, four or five days a week, then you know, go ahead and use uh, a regular um, CBD rich product like our general wellness um, and that will help with the anxiety. But if you get anxiety you know, once a week, a few times a month and you just want something to, to help you out in the, that acute phase, we have a formula, it's called Formula AX. And so again, I've paid attention to the cannabinoid profiles and ratios. It's not gonna make you euphoric. And I've watched the terpene ratios and made sure that we did pretty well on the, uh, the end of the relaxing and um, not so much sedating, but relaxing terpene profile and staying away from the activating terpene profile. So formula ZZZ and formula AX can be just used as needed. And of course, you know, the topicals, you get a bee sting, of course, use, use it topically as needed. You don't have to apply it for a week. It'll, mm -hmm. it's pretty dramatic. You get stung. I've been stung by a bee and, you know, went into the house and uh, I didn't even have our cream. I put a couple drops of our oil on it. And within a minute, the, the majority of that stinging was gone. I did need to reapply it a couple more times, but um, it really made a big difference. I, I love the sophistication that goes into, you know, the products and, and you're thinking on it and just the, the activity of how these different terpenes, you know, you know, how they play out in, in relation to, to the concentrations of CBD to THC. And, you know, it's, it's clearly not just here's a CBD product you should try. It's, it, there's so much thought, there's so much, you know, careful attention, you know, the use of the flowering, the virgin female flowering plants. I mean, this is all really critical information. I feel that people need to know about if they're going to, you know, consider using a CBD product because they're, they're clearly not all made the same with the same attention to detail. Uh, I think I find it fascinating to, to think about this upregulation process. You know, Dave and I teach a lot about adaptation through, you know, fasting or exercise or, you know, even breath work and meditation, all this stuff. Um, and, and I think it's just absolutely fascinating to think that these, you know, phytochemicals have this similar adaptive response where they, you know, upregulate uh, a change inside this, inside the body. Um, I mean, I feel like it's just a, such a really important methodology and philosophy to understand when we're, when we're working on healing the body. Um, can we, can we talk about some of the other, you know, situations or conditions for when people may consider using a CBD product? 
you know, we've heard of, you know, people using CBD uh, for cancer or maybe seizure disorder, but what are some of the other, you know, either clinical experiences you've had working with people in this product or, you know, some of the different, um, you know, maybe you know, applications that you've seen people use it for? Um, let me see. Yeah, you know, there was a, uh, it's, it's kind of a fun story and I, I haven't heard of this, you know, since, but we had somebody that reached out to us after they bought our product and he was having radiation for a throat cancer. Mm-hmm. And, um, what he wound up, oh, why am I forgetting the, the medical term for it? But his saliva was drying up mm-hmm. and zero, zero uh, stoma or something like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, the, you know, it, it sort of sounds like, oh, that's an inconvenience. It's a pretty significant issue. You have mm-hmm. difficulty eating, you get, you know, tooth decay and dental disease and all of this stuff. And he found using a few drops, not even a quarter dropper, he had about 80% return of his saliva production. And he had wow. it very, very fast. Wow. Um, so, you know, as we get more um, clinically effective products on the market. And as I say, I'm, I'm a little disappointed in our, our CBD industry right now because it's not regulated. And just like most of the time when we have, even if they were well-meaning people who started a corporation, um, we give corporations the rights of people, but we forget that they don't have a conscience. And so an unregulated industry is probably not a great thing for us to continue in the CBD space because the majority of the producers out there have shown us they cannot be, they can't produce their products with integrity. Um, But as we get more clinically effective products out there, I think we're going to find more and more uses for it. And we will probably find some indications in which you should avoid it as well. Right now, it's been the most forgiving, if I can call it a medicine, you know, legally I can't, but I will anyway. It's the most forgiving medicine I've ever been uh, involved with. Um, The full plant medicines, by the way, they have a broader therapeutic window. And so what that means is less will work than a CBD isolate. And then you can take more of it before you start having side effects. And so when you get the isolates, you get more of a peak in your therapeutic window. And we saw that too with Marinol. Marinol is a prescription medication that was out there to help with appetite in people that had wasting syndrome, especially HIV wasting. And it was not a really good medication because people either found it wasn't effective or they didn't like the side effects they had when they took it. And they preferred the marijuana plant because there was a much broader window in which, you know, it would work without giving them the side effects. And, you know, Marinol is a THC synthetic isolate. So they isolated the THC, then they synthesized it. And the good news for them is they were able to patent it so nobody else could do it. Um, But the bad news for, you know, all the people who were suffering is it's not the best medicine that could be made. It's just the best medicine that could be made and patented. Um, So my hope is, is that we're going to see more and more responsible producers out there. And as we do, we'll see more and more people having these, you know, beautiful antidotal stories that are going to hopefully turn into clinical trials, like the stories that have inspired me to get ours up and running. Awesome. Go ahead, David. Amazing. I think the big message, you know, just to wrap up today is you can't just go buy some CBD from just some random shop and just start taking it thinking you're going to get some good efficacy out of it. You kind of need somebody like a clinician who's very versed in these things and educated to help guide you with source, right? And then the type that we need to use and dosage and all those fun things. But man, you hit you hit it on the head today, man. I think you kind of opened people's eyes to realizing, oh, it's not as simple as just buying it and taking it. Well, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And, you know, the analogy I would use is, do you normally go to the gas station attendant for your medical advice? (laughs) You know, I, I've, I've heard of medicine through hairdressers as well. Um, And it's not that, you know, hairdressers can't give you good advice, but is that where you want your primary source of medical information coming from? I'm totally agreeing, man. And especially with this type of stuff, you kind of see this stuff just being kind of slung out everywhere now and everyone's become an expert and everybody's selling it, right? So yeah, huge message there for our listeners. 
Doc, that was, it was awesome, man. You educated me massively today. I learned a whole lot more about this stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. That's, uh, you know, we are an educational company as well as producing our, our products. So, um, and, you know, please feel free to, from a clinician standpoint, any clinician can reach out to me and I can speak with them freely. It gets to be a whole lot dicier when I'm talking about clients or patients because uh, the medical board gets very excited about that. Um, with this study coming out, we're likely to be a high price. I hope we're a high price profile company coming up here soon. And that does mean that I got to kind of ratchet it in and, and dot the I's and cross the T's and, you know, outside of a group of physicians probably refer to us as a supplement and not a medicine. And, you know, we didn't do the investigational new drug application and, and to recognize that we have a study that supports, supports us as a nutraceutical, but we're not a medicine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, vital information. I, I want to make sure that people um, can access, you know, maybe maybe the, the clinical trial, uh, your, your information, where's the best place for people to go again, and we'll put in our in our show notes as well, yeah. if people do have uh, uh, people that they know that need help. So for the trial information, it's clinicaltrials.gov, no spaces, and then type in endorage, which is spelled end our age, E N D. O-U-R-A-G-E, and that will bring up both of our studies, and it will show you which one was recruiting. Mm -hmm. We are not allowed to put a link to the clinicaltrials.gov uh, on our website because the FDA will reprimand us for making a claim. That's how aggressive the FDA is with this industry right now. Um, our website is endorage.com, so that's endourage.com. And if people want to get in touch with me directly, they can just uh, type in michael at endorage.com and you will get directly to the chief medical officer. We're that That's big. <laughs> <laughs> Not for long, though, I can imagine once once those trials go through. Uh, I mean, I think it's just exciting what you're doing and, and so needed uh, to develop and round out this conversation, especially when it comes to efficacy and quality control and quality assurance and getting the right product into the right people's hands. Uh, I mean, really commend you and we're, we're honored to know you and to speak to you today uh, on this really important topic. So thank you so much. Well, I really appreciate your help and uh, please reach out to me with any questions or concerns. And it is my hope we have a formulation called Rhythmia formulation that you are aware of that's mm -hmm. designed to help folks get off of antidepressant medications with assistance from a clinician. Um, but, uh, I'm excited about perhaps doing a phase four clinical trial with that one in the not too distant future. We'll have to see how things go. Definitely. And, and when that happens, I mean, let's, let's get back in this conversation and help people understand the role that this can play, uh, especially in addictions and recovery. Um, yeah. that's a whole nother conversation, which, which we look forward to having with you. Well, I sure appreciate the opportunity to, to share some information about my company and, um, I thank you. Thanks, Thanks Doc. Appreciate you, man.